It's Colossians, number one. And we're going to go to the third chapter. We're just going to look at a few verses in the third chapter tonight for our communion to prepare our hearts through the understanding, to enlighten our mind, give us a deeper understanding into the text. But before we do, maybe we'll pray. No? Well, definitely we will pray. But we're all going to pray. I'm, I'm going to share my heart to my father. That's what it is, communication to dad. Okay? Abba. And then you share your heart. Now, if you feel led to pray out loud tonight so that we can be blessed in the hearing, then amen. And in a few minutes, I'll close with a prayer as well. But pray louder. Listen, this is a small communion. We're family. Table. This is a Seder. This is very intimate, very personal. So don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. All have sinned and fall short. All of us are struggling in this portion of our salvation we call sanctification and being everything God wants us to be, right? And so the, the strongest can pull up the weakest, right? And when we reach out our hands, we can help one another, aid one another, lift one another up. Amen? So let's pray.
Colossians chapter 3. That's what we're going to look at. If then you were raised with Christ, well, <clears throat> Paul is assuming that the believers there in Colossae, have, in Colossae have identified with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's saying now, if in fact you truly have been raised with Christ, born of his spirit, becoming a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new, then he tells you what you need to do. And what does he say you need to do? Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Now, we know that there are many, many, many blessings associated with those who will seek him. In one of the courses we sang tonight, it talks about the fact that we're seeking him. I've shared with you before, I've been seeking him for 43 years. And I can't wait till that day when I apprehend him for my own. When I can wrap my arms around him and I hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, but the seeker is one who has come to the knowledge of God and seeks even more and more and more of him. And seek those things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God the Father. What are those things that are above that you should be seeking? I just said one of them is Jesus. Jesus, totally and completely, right? His righteousness, absolutely. I want his righteousness lived out in my life. I want to seek him to cleanse me of all my sins and to allow his righteousness to be imparted into my life through the person of the Holy Spirit. What else am I seeking that's above? I'm sorry? Holiness. Holiness, holiness. righteousness, holiness. Holiness speaks of my relationship to God. Righteousness speaks of my relationship to others. And I want both. I want to be rightly related to God. I want to be rightly related with everyone else in my life. What else is above? Communion. What? Communion. Communion. Yes. Communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And later, later on, Paul would say that, don't you know, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, right? So we're not here. We're really there. That's why Paul would say, those, those whom he justified, he glorified. Skips the whole sanctification process. He sees you already there. What else is above? His strength. Oh, do we need his strength, right? Especially, <laughs> especially as time goes on and we get a little bit older, we recognize how much more we need his strength. Hmm? But more importantly, not just physical strength, but that spiritual strength, emotional strength, that, that, that strength to stand for him and for his word, to be as bold as lions in the day of adversity, because the day of adversity is coming, right? Hmm. But we need not fear anything, beloved. No. What, what else might you be seeking above? Guidance? Guidance? Wisdom? Wisdom more to be sought after than gold. Silver. Uh, knowledge more, more to be sought after than silver. Look at what men would give for gold and silver. But yet wisdom, knowledge, seems to be in rare commodity right now. His love, oh yes, first and foremost, to seek his love, that which is above. Now, what, he, what he's telling us here is then, where's your mind? If you've really been raised with Christ, where's your mind? Is, is your mind on the mundane? Is it on the temporal? Is it on the earthly? Is it on the fleshly, the carnal? Or is it in the heavenly, on the eternal, on the spiritual? Mm -hmm. So seek those things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Sitting at the right hand means he's sitting in power and in authority, right? At the right hand of the Father. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Here's what I want you to do now. You listening? Go ye therefore, right? And what are we to do? Take scalps? No. Make disciples. Make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That's where our command. Now that's our commission. As he's got all authority, all power. And then he says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Where are you to set your affections? Where are you to set your heart? Uh, I think the King James Version. Does anybody have a King James Bible? What's it say on your Bible? It says set your affections. On set your affections. But, but really the Greek word is set your mind. Your mindset should be that, that your desire is for him. Right? Your love. Do you set your mind on him? Where is it most of the time? Your desires, your longings. If someone would say to you, you know, what, what do you desire most in life? Is it something of this world or is it something that's out of this world? Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, did you? And how in what way did we die? I'm sorry? We died in him, yes. But what died in me? 
The old man, the sinful nature. That sinful nature, that longing for this world and to take care of my own needs, physical needs, emotional needs, whatever they might be. No, all of that has died within me, and now I want to live for him. And I don't want my sin nature controlling me any longer. I want him to control me. He's going to talk about that. Where your heart is, where your mind is, where your peace is, where your life is. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And, and this word hidden in the Greek text means that your life now is in a secret place that is safe and secure. Isn't that wonderful? That's where we are now. Hidden in Christ. Safely tucked away. You know, I've said so many times, you know, we've lost Gus and Roberta, but oh, aren't we so glad that they are safely tucked away now in heaven with him, absolutely secure. But you know, the reality is, so are we right now. So are we right now, hidden in Christ. What that means is that if you really have identified with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you're setting your mind and your heart on things above, you are absolutely secure. Secure in this life and absolutely secure in the life to come for an eternity. In that secret place. That's right. That's right. You're the treasure. You're that pearl of great price. You're that treasure hidden in the field hmm? that Jesus gave everything for. You didn't give anything for him. He gave everything for you. And when Christ, who is our life, is he? That's the question. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Yeah. I'm amazed at the number of people who call themselves Christian but really aren't looking forward to the Lord's return. Yeah, 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 but you know, well, maybe not right now. Oh, no. If Christ is your life, you can't wait for him to appear. I can't wait to see some people who have gone before me. Isn't that true of you? If I've been gone for some period of time, I can't wait to see Gail again, you know? I can't wait to be home, Right? Is that your longing in your heart for a city you've never seen, for a home you've never laid your eyes on, but you can't wait to get there? Hmm? Hmm. First John talks about that. Go to First John. First John. First John, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, the manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Technon. Born ones, adopted. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. Right? Dr. Chafee told us we're not going to be disembodied spirits, are we? But I'm not going to be in this body, thank God. <laughs> I told my wife on the way over here, I said, we, I need to get out of the Voltaren tonight. This arthritic finger is paining me, and i got to rub some on my knee. My knee's bothering me. <laughs> I can't wait to get that new body. Huh? But it's going to be a body, a glorious body. He said he's going to prepare a mansion for you. And do you understand that that mansion is the new body? Hmm? Yeah. Eternal, in the heavens, celestial. He goes on to say... And we know that uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3 in particular, now to what we're talking about. And everyone who has this hope, what hope? His return is appearing. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. What do we do? Go back to Colossians chapter 3. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. You ain't seen who I really am yet, but oh, wait till you see me then. Right? Hmm. Verse 5, therefore, now verses 1 through 4, he's talking about our justification. And that, that's, I'm, I'm so thankful that God brought me to that place where I have surrendered to him, yielded to him as my Lord and Savior. I'm justified. He looks upon me just as if I've never sinned, declares me righteous. But now he's talking about something I have to will to do, Right? Uh, now listen, this, this, this is where I understand where my free will has a real struggle. Hmm? I am self-determined in some ways, in some areas. And the most difficult period, place for you and I to be surrendered, to be self-willed, to be self-determined is in our willingness to yield completely to the Holy Spirit's will in our life. To really allow Christ to sanctify us completely. Mind, body, soul. 
what he talks about in Thessalonians. Look what it says. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry. Passions is, is, is a lust, right? Fornication, that's poneria, that's, that's uh, sexual immorality. Uncleanness is just impurity. This evil desire, that's a, illicit cravings that you might have. Covetousness, greed, envy, jealousy, which is idolatry. All of it's idolatry. And who's the idol that you're worshiping? Self. Self. Self, of course. But he goes on to say, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. What's the gospel? What have you been saved from? That's wrath. Praise God. The wrath of God is coming upon this world and the sons of disobedience. And it's not going to be pretty. I have heard people say numerous times they like the Bible, the God of the New Testament, but not the God of the Old Testament. They think the God of the Old Testament is too judgmental, too harsh. You ain't seen nothing yet, honey. Wait till he, wait, wait till he comes. And the re, what the Bible describes for us in Romans is that there is a reservoir. You know what a reservoir is, right? They block up certain valleys and areas where it's dammed up and all this water builds up in the reservoir. Some of them are huge reservoirs. I mean, millions of gallons of water, right? And so God describes in Romans that his wrath is a reservoir of wrath being stored up. Oh, boy, I can't imagine how much wrath. I mean, we see the perversion, the evil, the corruption that exists today in our day. It's absolutely amazing. I touched on it slightly on Sunday about you know, this administration allowing the slaughter of so many people in this war in Ukraine, so unnecessary. Do you see what the Ukrainians are doing now? Who are they constricting now? Women. Women. They're losing so many men in this war, this unnecessary war. Nobody here to heckle me tonight. You've got to stop me. Because <laughs> I, I can really get excited about this. Anybody know who Jeffrey Sachs is? Professor, economist, Columbia University? No? Google Jeffrey Sachs, uh, YouTube. Listen to his explanation on how we are to blame for all of this. And it goes back into the 90s into the 90s, and he's pleading with the administration to please, there could be a diplomatic situation, a solution to all of this. We don't want that. No, no, no. Greed. Idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. I said the, the wrath of God is described in Romans as this reservoir, this reservoir of wrath. And what Paul describes is that there's coming a moment when that last ounce of wrath is put out into that reservoir, and it damn bursts forth. We've seen the destructive force that a, that a broken dam, a broken reservoir can do in, in flooding an area. Well, that's precisely what Paul describes, that the wrath of God is reserved in heaven against all unrighteousness, and there's coming a moment in time when it's all going to break forth, and what's it going to cover? The entire globe. But we've been rescued. We've been saved from that. That's the good news. That's the gospel. We've been saved from the wrath of God. I am now. The object of his what? His perfect love. And the sons of disobedience, what are they? Is that really true? It just doesn't feel right. You know? There's a lot of mysteries in the scripture that I can't understand sometimes. And my heart and my emotional side had a hard time processing. But I have to accept what the Bible teaches. And I have to say, it's okay. Are you, are you okay with a lot of mystery in your life? Yeah. Then you'll be accepting of that. You'll allow God to be God. Yes, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you also want when walked when we lived in them. Oh, yes, we did. 29 years, 29 years before I came to know him. Anybody longer? How many? You got saved at 40 years. 40 years you walked in disobedience. Not you, Carolyn. You were born in obedience. I know you. You, know, you, you and Mother Mary, I mean, you're... Well, I was 15 when I really became a Christian. 15. And I'm sitting here. I mean, I'm 78. 15, praise God. Yeah, I was 29, 29 approaching 30 when I got saved. 
lot of, lot of disobedience there. I can identify exactly what he's saying here. And such were some of you. So uh, is that not true? You can't forget where you came from. You get prideful. You know? You start thinking more of yourself than you ought. You constantly have to remember what he rescued, what he saved you from. He saved me not only from his wrath, he saved me from me. I had to be saved from my own sinful nature. Yes, but now, but now you must put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, attitude towards others. It could be even your attitude towards God. People get angry at God, you know. Blasphemy, slandering the Lord, evil, uh, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have been put off the old man with his deeds. Yeah, as I pointed out on Sunday, you know, how does the devil, devil really destroy us? What power does he have that wrecks such destruction upon the world that has caused such pain and suffering, such sorrow? What is it? Lies. Lies. When we look at him, we're going to say, oh, you! Yeah, but through his lies. And we know, listen, we know the damage lies can, can cause. Today, who was it? Somebody's going to uh, put a defamation lawsuit against the president? What's, what's his name? You don't know? Giuliani. Giuliani, the next mayor of uh, New York City, defamation lawsuit because of what Biden, Biden said about him, and it's caused him the loss of millions of dollars, et cetera, et cetera, but lies. And one of the, one of the things he said in the press conference today is we have a president who is a serial liar. Is it not true? But no wonder he's a child of who? And he's the father of all lies, all lies, lies. That's the power that Satan has. That the destructive force of Satan is that lying tongue. And you and I need to be very, very careful to be honest with one another. And sometimes you have to be painfully honest, you know, being open, transparent. And you have put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Of him who created him, yes. For there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. Is Christ everything to you in every aspect of your life? Yeah. Therefore, oh, here we go again, talking about mysteries. Therefore, as the what? Oh, boy, I know this. Here we go. Now, you, you, your gas, those, those gastric juices are already being released in some of your stomachs, aren't they? Listen, I, I was a full throttle free willer, okay? <laughs> because believing in election and predestination caused me a lot of consternation. But I've realized it's okay. I can have large quantities of mystery in my life when it comes to God. Because if I could really have the mind of God, then my God's not very big at all, right? If I could really understand him completely and understand all of his ways. This word election, does anybody know what it is, the elect of God? Ek kaleto. It's ek kaleto. Now, you know what it means if you go to your Greek concordance? A favorite. A chosen favorite is what the word is. Why would I have a problem that God identifies me as his chosen favorite? Do you have a problem with that, folks? OK, thank you. But the mystery is, why hasn't he chosen everyone? No, that's not the mystery. Listen to me. That's not the mystery. The mystery is, why has he chosen anyone? That's the real mystery. Isn't that true? Yeah. No, I can't make an apology for it. This is what it says, that God chose you to be one of his favorites. He spoke to the multitude, the fish and chips crowd, for thousands, right? And then he drew unto himself 70, 35 evangelistic teams that went out two by two. Remember that? And they were rejoicing at the way God was using them so powerfully in being a witness to the gospel. But he took the multitude, he wore it down to the 70, and then the 70, he brought it down to the 12. He prayed all night, and he selected the 12. And why did he select them? What does the text tell us? That they might be with him. That's it. Hey, ladies, you know, your husband, he wants to be alone, just not by himself. <laughs> I want to be with my wife. I love it when she's in the house. 
you know? But I'm not a person who needs a lot of communication, you know? No. But I'll let you talk to me all you want. <laughs> Just don't look for a response. <laughs> no, I do respond. Okay. Where was I? On occasion. On occasion. Where, where was I now? Where was I? Mysteries, right? Ecletos. Ecletos. To be the chosen favorite. The mystery, the mystery is not that he chooses some. The mystery is why he has chosen anyone. Is that not true? That's right. Where do you find that? I don't know. <laughs> In the Bible. Prego. First Corinthians 2. <laughs> but go read on. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. You know, this is exactly how he describes the church in the book of Romans. He says, you're the elect of God, right? He says, you're holy and you're beloved. Go to Romans chapter 1. You need to see who you, who you really are. And don't make any apology for that. If God wants to do that, God can do that. Christy, when you and Darren went to um, Sierra Leone to adopt the children, you had a choice among a number of children you could adopt? Oh, yeah. How many were there? Probably 24. And you only adopted two? <laughs> yeah. What are you laughing about? <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> How cruel. How unjust. How unrighteous. You mean 22, you mean 22 children stayed there? Oh. And you only adopted two? <laughs> <laughs> You know the point I'm making. Yes, I know. You know the point I'm making. I get it. Okay? I get it. Was, that, was that cruel of her and Darren? Did Darren and her not have the right to go over there and, and at least try to rescue two? Uh, it's a mystery to some that they would go and rescue any. Right? Because, because that's a huge obligation, responsibility. And, and not just talking about the financial obligation, but just that, that, that giving of yourselves, a pouring of yourself until they're old enough to leave the house. Right? Does God not have the right? Absolutely. Where did I say to go? Romans 1. Okay, go there. Uh, Paul talks about being a servant of Jesus Christ. Oh, here he goes again, called. You know? But look at verse 7. To all who are in Rome, the recipients of the letter were the believers of Rome. Those who are the beloved, what is that word? Agapetos, Agapetos beloved of God, unconditionally, sacrificially, God chose to love them. The called, kaletos, they were called to be the beloved of God. Hagios, saints. Now this is precisely what he says in Colossians, okay? You're the called, beloved saints of God. Called because God chose you. God chose to save you. God chose to rescue you. God chose to make you his own and to put you in that secret place of his love, his presence. And God chose to make you holy. How? To the person of his Holy Spirit and seeking that holiness, our relationship to God, that righteousness, our relationship one to another. Back to the text in Colossians. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. I'm working on that, you know? I'm becoming more merciful and gracious as I get older. I, th I like being getting older because I'm not, I thought I was going to become a cranky old man, you know, a miserable old man. I didn't want to do that. No, you won't let me do that. Wait, no, no. She's a tenderizer in my life. God brought her in my life to do that. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness. Humility, no pride, no place for pride. Meekness, meaning a gentleness about me, a graciousness, long-suffering, mm, bearing with one another, forgiving. You know, listen, if, I, if I've offended you in some way, I'm sorry. Now, if the truth has offended you, well, I'm sorry for you. If I've done something to offend you and it hasn't anything to do with the truth, then please forgive me, I'm sorry. But you know... What he's really saying here, as the body of Christ, as a family, as brothers and sisters, we can't keep a record of wrongs. We can't continue to keep grudges or be angry with one another unnecessarily. 
Now, you can't come to the communion table if you have anything against anybody. Paul warns us of that. If you do make it right, then come to the communion table. But I'm just telling you tonight, if there's someone that you have a problem with, you haven't gotten over it, you need to get over it. And the best way to get over it is, is, is open up about it. Be honest about it. Be transparent. Deal with it. You know. That, uh, one thing I enjoyed about my Italian family, you knew if somebody was upset with you. You didn't have to guess. You didn't have to wonder. And it wasn't even going to be days for you to find out. It would be minutes. And you'd find out they're upset with you. <laughs> but, but I enjoyed that about them because it was very open and very honest. And then we work it out. You know, we go to a restaurant and you think we all hated each other when it came to who's going to pay the bill. Because they're arguing about who's going to pay the bill. I'm going to pay. No, you're going to, I'm going to pay the bill. No. <laughs> But we, as the, as the people of God, we need to be very open with one another, long-suffering, forgiving one another, tender-hearted, merciful to one another. Just as God has forgiven me, how can I not forgive you? And if I've done something wrong and I know it, I'll confess it. I'll, I'll ask for your forgiveness because I, I, I don't want there to be aught between us. And I surely don't want there to be aught between me and God. So if I've done anything to offend him in any way when I'm aware of it, I get on my knees and I ask him to forgive me. Forgive me for not representing you the way I should. Forgive me for not being who you've called me to be. But of all these things, put on what? Love. Verse 14, you put on love, which is a bond of perfection. The unity of the Spirit is produced in our love for God and our love one for another. Paul would say over and over again to the churches he planted, I know of your love towards God and your love one for another. Your faith towards God and your love one to another. If you're right with God, then you're going to be right with everybody else as much as in your power here on earth. But of all things, put on love, the bond of perfection. And then what? Let the peace of God rule in your heart to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Now, I can only have peace reigning. This is, this is peace, the peace of God reigning or ruling or controlling your life, controlling your heart. Now, the only way I can have peace that he's talking about, that, that shalom, that irene, peace with, of, in God, is when I really am at peace with God. Now, if you're a hypocrite, and you know you're just playing games and you're pretending to be something that you're not, then you're going to be an angry person. There's not going to be much love that's coming forth out of your life, and you're certainly not going to have any peace because you know your conscience is convicting you constantly. But when you're right with God, and as much as is within your power, that's the way Paul puts it, I'm right with everybody else in my life, I've got peace. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If you're right with God and you're right with man, you have peace. You can lay down at night and be thankful. Amen? So important. So important. This communion, that's what we're talking about here. Having a communion with God that is open, that is honest, that is genuine, that is sincere, that is transparent. Yes, love is the bond of perfection. Peace should rule in your hearts. And then he says, let the word of Christ, what? Dwell in you richly. Now, you can't either have either one of the former without having some good understanding and knowledge of the Word of God. You know how often I have to be in the Word of God? And if I'm not in the Word of God every day, you know who shows up? Igor. Yeah. It's the Word of God that is the only thing I have that is self-correcting in my life to keep me on the right path having that, that love, that bond of perfection, having that peace of God that rules in my heart, is as I stay in the Word of God, stay in communication with my Father. And that has to be a daily event. And I'm not talking about just doing a five-minute devotion and away I go, like looking in a mirror and then forgetting who I am. That's how Paul references it. But I'm talking about deep communion where you're asking God to really do an introspection. We started Jeremiah this morning, right? The weeping prophet. The theme of Jeremiah's return unto me. God's calling his people to shuva, to shuva, turn to me, turn to me, turn to me. Two things you've done. What are the two things he's done? I mentioned it this evening at the beginning of the service, John Michael. What are the two things they've done that he's accusing him for? You've forsaken the fountain of living water. And you've dug out for yourself cisterns that hold no water.
we have a responsibility to be in the Word constantly, but more importantly, for the Word to be in us. I have a responsibility not to read the Word, but to let the Word read me. And it does. It informs me of the good, the bad, and the darn right ugly. Yeah, right? And, that, and then I have that opportunity to surrender. Now, the reason why some people just, they don't, they don't have that bond of perfection, the love that they should. They don't have that peace in their heart. They don't have peace with others. When, why? They're not in the Word. Listen, the lifeblood of the believer is being in the Word so that the living Word is in us. But if you're not in the written word, you're not understanding how the living word wants to abide within you to let that peace reign in you, that bond of perfection to be displayed in your life. And then his wisdom abounds richly. Now, what will steal that away? Oh, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, being busy, 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 being under Satan's yoke. Hmm? But let the word of God dwell in you richly with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms. The psalms were, were hymns that were put to music, worship songs. A worship service was used there. Asaph, Heman, the worship leaders of Israel. Hymns, other, other songs, spiritual songs, other, other ballads that were written describing their love for God and appreciation for him. With singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Our faith is a singing faith. You know that, right? Now, since I, I, I wasn't a singer before I got saved. After I got saved, I haven't stopped singing. I sing all the time. As, as my wife and I go through the Bible, I can't tell you how many songs a scripture will remind me of, and I break out in a song. You know. Do you? Is your faith a singing faith? I'm asking you a question. Yeah. You know. My, now, my wife's here. She'll bear witness. I wake up singing, don't I? Yeah. I wake up in the morning, I'll be singing. If I'm not, even before coffee, yeah, before coffee, yeah. But if I'm not singing, then there's something wrong. I, I didn't wake up in the right mood. But normally I wake up with a song in my heart. And I, and I sing. I love to sing, you know. And Snickers sings with me. Oh! <laughs> but why? Why is it a singing faith? Why are we singing people? Joy. The joy in our hearts. Yeah. People who, who sing, who like to sing, or people who whistle while they're working, I think they, they hum a melody, they're just happy people. They're joyous. And that's what he's talking about here. It's the joy of the Lord that just makes our life a song. Yeah. You know, I, I, in another life, I think I'm going to be a worship leader. But I don't believe there's another life. I only have this one. Hmm. I'll be in the choir, yeah. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Hey, here's what I say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. And then go do anything you want. It's quite legitimately for me to say that, right? That's a legitimate statement. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then go do anything you want. Why? Because loving God will keep you from doing those things that he wills you not to do. Loving God will keep you doing those things he wills you to do. It's all about love and not law. If you're just trying to obey the law, you're going to be upset, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be discouraged, you're going to be mad, you're going to be resentful. I can't keep all these rules. <laughs> but if it's a love relationship... It's no problem at all. It's my delight to do your will, O oh Lord. It's taken him a long time to get me there. I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm not completely where I need to be. I know that. But I'm sure far better off than where I was. You know? How about you? Can you say that? In your delight for the Lord? And, and then he goes on and he, he says, listen, listen, this, this, this communion that you have with God, this openness, this understanding, this relationship, this feasting with him at his table, it should bring the result of having the right relationships with everyone around you. I was talking to a young man who called me about marriage today. And I said, uh, hang on. 
But marriage is so ravaged today. And unfortunately, listen to this. The statistics are that marriages in the church are at a higher rate of divorce than marriages outside the church. So why is that? Well, because most of them outside the church aren't getting married. <laughs> That's why. But, but none, none of the fact. But of those being married, a higher percentage is being divorced within the church than outside of the church. Now, why would that be? Yeah, that, well, that's, that's, that's true. They're not the body of Christ. But listen to me. Where my free will needs to be exercised. You want, you want to talk about free will? You want to be all in on the free will? Radical free willer? And completely surrender to God and do everything he wants you to do in sanctification. Be honest to God. Be honest to yourself. Be honest to God. How much are you truly obeying God? Is it 100%? Is everything, everything that he shared, is that what you're doing? Lord, I only did that which you had commanded me to do and nothing more. But at least we could do that. Is that not right? Now, that's where my free will really comes into play. Because I have the power now within me to obey God. What's, what's the mystery of Colossians? The mysterion here in Colossians? Christ in me, the hope of glory. And what does it mean? What's the interpretation of that? Christ in me, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit will empower me to live a life obedient to God, displaying his glory. Everybody's going to glorify God in heaven. That's a given. Is that not true? This communion gives you the opportunity to confess your shortcomings, your unwillingness to surrender, to yield to him, and to ask him to give you that power. Lord, I want to display the mysterion. That's a wonderful mystery that the world needs to see. Unfortunately, it's missing. That great mystery on Christ in me, the hope of glory, meaning right now, right now in this flesh, I can live a life that glorifies God. I can love my wife like Christ loved the church. I can do all things for the glory of God, whether in word or in deed, because I have the power now within me. Now, is my free will going to allow me to surrender? You're saved. Now surrender to him. Yield to him. Humble yourself. That's what the world needs to see. Mahat Gandhi was right when they asked him, what do you think about Christianity? Show me one and I'll let you know. Show me one and I might consider it. We have so many bad, bad, bad examples. Professors without possessors, lip in the life, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Do you understand? The, the, the recipient of the power and the work of Christ in my life, first and foremost, should be displayed where? Who should be the recipient of that? John? That's right, for, as far as you're concerned. As far as I'm concerned, it should be Gail. First and foremost, the recipient of all of that blessing, that, that perfection of love, that peace reigning over me, that the word of God dwells within me richly. And if that's not there, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. Worst of all, like so many in this world, self-deceived. Self-deceived. How do I know that I'm in that relationship, that communion with the Lord that I need be, must be, that he commands me to be, is as he is living his life through me. That more and more you and everybody else in my life and you see Christ in me. And that I see Christ in you. That's what this is all about. You've come to the table tonight. And when you walk away from the table, we should be a better son and daughter to God, a better husband and wife, better mother and father, better son and daughter, better brother and sister than we were when we came in. Because progressively, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by he's changing us, shaping us and conforming us into the image of his son. How? First and foremost, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Come on, there's a lot of people, you know, they spout out, they can spout out verses of the Bible as effortlessly, but yet their personal lives are ravaged. Why? Because it's all the law. It's all the head and not the heart. That's not what God wants from us. Oh, he wants you to have the understanding, but he wants it to dwell down into the heart. Dwell in you richly. So that what you give others is something truthful. Hmm. You know where the lie is displayed more than any place else in the church culture today? Where? Pulpit. Pulpit? 
<laughs> well, the, the beggars are at the pulpit, not at the gate anymore. <laughs> Funerals. The, the lie that Satan has convinced the world of is propagated more at funerals than any place else in the Christian world. Huh? No, nobody, you, you ever go to a funeral and everybody goes to heaven? Yeah. Nobody's in hell. I've had to preach a couple of those very uncomfortable funerals where there was no reason in the world for me to believe the deceased was in heaven. And I didn't speak of them. I didn't speak of them going to heaven. I spoke to the lost. I said, if they were here today, they'd tell you, they'd warn you. No, but you go to a funeral today and everybody dies and goes to heaven. You think it's true, what Rob Bell said. Love wins, but is it true? No, but how many, how many, how many pastors, how many representatives of Christ have the courage to speak the truth rather than meet somebody's emotionally felt needs? Speak the truth in love. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. And dwelling in you richly means you speak the truth. Now, I don't know if you caught it Sunday, but I told that man, I'll say whatever I want to say at this point, whatever God tells me to say from this pulpit. But nobody tells me what to say except him. But I have to. I'm under obligation. I'm under contract to speak the truth, no matter whether you like it or not. And those mysteries, I'm sorry, they give me just as much indigestion as they give you. But they're mysteries. And one day we'll find out all of the answers, won't we? But in the meantime, we'll love one another. Right? And the essentials? Unity. The non-essentials? Liberty. But in all things? Charity. Love. Love. Mm. I think I give you enough to chew on for a little while. He, he, listen, he invited you and me tonight to this table. And every one of them said, Lord, is it I? And they were so honest. You remember he said, tonight, this night, one of you will betray me. Your, your actions, your desires, your heart, the world won't fully represent me. And every single one of them said, Lord, is it I? Now, why would they say that? They knew their hearts. You know your heart. And I, I have to say, Lord, Lord, there's no question about it. It's I. There are times when I've misrepresented you. There are times when I haven't represented you the way I should. But Lord, I want you to forgive me now. I want you to restore me. And I want you to use me more than you ever have before. May my last days be my best days in living the mystery of Colossians. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen? That should be our prayer tonight as we come together. All right, what are we doing for communion tonight? Are we just playing some songs? Yeah. So uh, you, no, no newbies here, no, right? No new people? OK, good. Oh, you're new. You've never been on communion before? Not yet. Oh. OK, we don't pass the elements. What we do is we uncover the elements, and then this is a time where you and the Lord commune. And when the Lord tells you, when he gives you permission, he tells you to come forward, you come forward, and you partake of the body and the blood of Christ. Symbols, not the actual body, not the actual blood. These are symbols of his broken body, shed blood, OK? But you have to be, now, if, if don't come in an unworthy manner. If the, listen, if there's a period of, in your life, if there's a portion of your life where you haven't surrendered to God and you know it, then don't eat and drink judgment to yourself. Be honest to God about it and watch him work. Mm. David, what was the song you closed with on Sunday? Yeah. That's from what book? What's the context? I'll talk about it Sunday, because we'll get there in Acts chapter 7. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house you have built for me? Whom of you will hear the cry of my heart? Where will my resting place be? Here, O oh Lord, have I prepared for you a home. Long have I desired for you to dwell. Here, O oh Lord. 
Lord, have I prepared a resting place. Here, O oh Lord, I wait for you alone. That song expresses everything this means. Idolatrous Israel. We're in all of their religious practices. And there's a big difference between religion and theology, right? Maybe we'll talk about that Sunday. But their religious practices afforded them nothing. But it's a heart for God. If you've been raised with Christ, therefore, seek him. Amen? Amen.